Jazakumullahu khairan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I truly appreciate the initiative that Micah has taken to organize an event like this because it is so needed. Um, my husband and I have not been as busy as we have been since this lockdown began. Um, Counselling couples, new couples, um, people who've been married for decades and it's just so shocking and appalling to see the state of marriages today. So may Allah bless you for putting this event together and um, may all those who participate benefit from the knowledge and wisdom that the speakers are sharing inshallah and may it serve as a witness for all of you now um, just uh, yesterday or two days ago one of the organizers called me and said i should try and make sure that while i speak i carry everybody along because in the house there's going to be people who are yet to be married and of course seasoned couples who have been married for decades so um, he used a word which I loved and I rephrased my whole presentation to go according to that. He said it should be the evolution of marriage, you know, from the ground up so that hopefully people can get it right. Um, I think that is just a perfect um, statement. Let me start. Now, few selections in human life can be as sensitive and as important and essential as selecting a life partner. This selection, finding somebody to spend the rest of your life with, has the fundamental potential to determine your success and prosperity or your misery and misfortune. And that means, yes, your marriage can either make you or break you. Now, for me, I describe marriage as two unique individuals who come together to complement one another, not to complete one another, who guide and encourage each other to get closer to their maker, who grow together in God consciousness, and who try to encourage each other to be careful and wary of offending Allah. Two unique individuals who help and support each other's development emotionally, intellectually, socially, and in service to humanity. Two individuals who come together to fulfill each other's needs, wants, and fantasies, who are garments for one another, who protect each other's dignity, who look out for each other's best interests, whom they feel emotionally and physically safe with, Together, they get to build and nurture a loving, safe home and a climate and a culture where each one gets to thrive and achieve their highest calling. Who they keep no secrets from, in other words, their confidence. Who get to know each other better than anyone else in the world, where they are able to be their true selves around. Marriage is about give and take of mutual fulfillment and mutual satisfaction. It's about living with your companion, with your buddy, your mate, your best friend and your lover, the one whom you get to grow old with, who you go on a lifelong adventure of self-discovery and personal evolution, whose soul you get to fall in love with, with whom the steady burning embers of true love remains constant even after the fire of passion has died down. Whenever you look at each other, you feel contentment in your hearts. Why? because you're with the person that Allah has created just for you. That sounds so beautiful, doesn't it? <laughs> However, how many don't know what I'm describing? How many here would say, I don't know what you're talking about? How many have never witnessed such a beautiful relationship? Alhamdulillah for me, I was so privileged to see what I just described to you, personified by my parents, in their 50 years of marriage. And Alhamdulillah, what my husband Saeed and I have been able to create, inshallah, by September, we would have been married 29 years, is turning out to be just as beautiful. Now, I'm sure when I was describing marriage to you, some people were thinking, eh, eh, not in my house. We don't know what that looks like. In my house, we fight. In my house, I see disrespect. I see shouting. I see one spouse putting the other down. I feel trapped. I feel broken. I am abused, either emotionally, physically, psychologically, economically, or even sexually abused. And yes, there's sexual abuse in a home where one spouse either deprives the other or one spouse rapes the other. I grew up seeing, or I'm in a relationship where there's contempt. I'm disgusted with my spouse. 
I feel betrayed by my spouse. I am disappointed. I've become a manager in my home. I manage. I've become like a roommate with my spouse because everybody is just doing their own thing. There's nothing in this relationship. I'm in a relationship where there's manipulation, there's games playing, there's politics at play, where you get one family member or children to take sides with one where there's a struggle for power, where you want to flex muscles or show off. Maybe you want to show off economic superiority. I come from this affluent home or spiritual superiority or intellectual superiority. I know more than you. The list can go on and on and on. But to me, the big question is why? If Allah has described marriage with words like love and mercy, and we're meant to dwell in tranquility. I mean, dwell in tranquility is like to lounge in peace, in contentment, in happiness. And nowhere did Allah describe in the Quran marriage to be one of managing one another, of disrespect, of self-sacrifice. Nowhere did he say we are supposed to be oppressed in marriage. In fact, in Islam, oppression is worse than slaughter. So why is it so hard to get marriages to work today? Why are so many, many marriages not working compared to those that are? Why are some couples ready to put in 110%? Why most are not? Why does love and mercy not exist in certain homes while it does in a few? And how do things deteriorate to this state? What I find interesting, and I know people will think this is a bit controversial, but what I find is interesting is how many take their religious rituals more seriously than their marriage. Yes, they take their prayers more seriously than their marriage. They take fasting more seriously than marriage. The sadaqa, the non-obligatory acts, all of the obligatory and non-obligatory acts, they take those things more seriously than marriage. Visiting the sick, the sunnah look and the hijabi look, the memorization of the Qur'an, the nawafils, the extra zikr, in other words, all the extra extra. When fulfilling our obligations to our spouse constitutes half of our faith. That is what I find so amazing. That we take all those individual, individual acts of ibadah more seriously than this one single one-stop shop where it constitutes half of our faith. So if you put all the others together, that is half, the non-obligatory and the obligatory. However, fulfilling your obligations to your spouse in marriage takes care of the other half. So it's not about, and I know a lot of scholars aren't talking and emphasizing this because many people, when I talk to them, I'm like, why do you want to get married? They say, oh, because it fulfills half, half of my faith. I was like, eh -eh, it's not that. It's fulfilling your obligations that completes half of your faith. Not just because, oh, I'm married now. I can go and face the other. No, 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 no. Isn't that what everyone should be fighting for? Because right there, you've taken care of half. Then face the memorization. Face the making sure you pray and you pray on time and the fasting and the umrah and hajj and all that. Why aren't we fighting for something that takes care of half of our faith that is fulfilling our obligation? And there's an added bonus to that. It brings true happiness and peace of mind when you fulfill your obligations to one another in marriage. No money in the world you will ever accumulate will give you the kind of peace of mind that comes from having a happy, peaceful home. There is nothing, nothing like having peace of mind. You can be stinking rich, but if you're not at peace with your family, with your spouse, there is no enjoyment, no peace of mind. And a good marriage can give you that and even more. That is wealth to me. Because fulfilling your obligations is the foundation of having a peaceful home and a happy spouse. Because if each and every one of you are playing their part, everyone is doing their role, most likely you will both be so happy because everybody is doing their own, that each one is going to be more eager to satisfy all your needs, all your wants, all your fantasies. If part of our obligations to one another in marriage as Muslims is a halal relationship, yes, this is one of the compulsory requirements by Allah, that we have a halal relationship, then by fulfilling that, fulfilling one's intimacy needs, to me, this will bring down the rate of infidelity, which is at an all-time high.
committed by both spouses. My husband and I counsel a lot. And we are finding more women are involved in these kind of relationships compared to the past, which will also bring down the rate of sexual frustration by both. You hear the man complain that the spouse is depriving him or not ready to do the bedroom acrobatics and so on. Then you hear the wife complaining that her husband doesn't care about her needs. He's just interested in his own. Once he climaxes, he's gone. So if we focus on just that alone, fulfilling our obligations, and one of which, like I said, is a halal relationship, this will also reduce the rate at which people are turning to pornography and masturbation, which again is on the rise. And again, amongst women, that for me is so alarming. And again, you ask why? They say it's sexual frustration. My husband doesn't care about my needs. Another obligation of ours as Muslims in marriage is to show love, to show respect and kindness. This is compulsory. Once you choose to get married, these are the things Allah is going to question you about. Any normal human being who receives love, respect and kindness will respond in kind. Any normal human being. And there are some who are not normal out there. But I love that the Prophet ﷺ said that the heart has been created in a way that it loves those who show kindness towards it and dislike those who cause it pain. The heart, our hearts have been created by Allah in a way that we respond to kindness and we dislike those who cause us pain. And if you show respect, you show kindness, you show love, you will get it. Your heart will melt. And the Prophet ﷺ also said, indeed, amongst the believers with the most complete faith, with the most complete faith, is the one who is best in conduct and most kind to his family. So instead of us giving these quotes on the tips of our tongues, we should translate the narrations into actions. What, we, what has been prescribed to us by Allah and in the examples of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I think that's what the hadith is for. Instead of just being able to quote it in Arabic and every other language and show we know, we know, we know all these quotes, we are missing out. We're focusing on the sunnah look more than the sunnah way. If we simply go by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's example of how he related with his family, how he related with his spouses, Yes, and I said spouses. Even when he became a polygamous man after Khadija radiallahu anha died, he was fair, he was just, he was equitable with his wives, which is amongst the obligations that a spouse has to their spouse. This is another one we're going to be questioned on. Are you fair, just, and equitable to your wife or wives? Anyone who goes into polygamy without equity, without fairness, without justice is sitting on a bee's nest. You cannot live your life doing as you please without fulfilling these obligations. Once you choose to invite Allah to witness your union, you're going to have to answer to him. And one of the prerequisites of that union is that you fill, fulfill your basic obligations. When I think about how many people are behaving so badly in their marriages today, I worry about what they are going to go and say to their maker. What happened to the love and mercy that he said he has placed in our hearts? He didn't say, after you get married, after you do this, you do that, I'm going to place love and mercy. He said, we have placed love and mercy in your hearts. So it's already defaulted. It's factory setting. We have it in there. So where did it go? I often say there is no miracle lecture that will fix your marriage. There is no du'a, no fast, no prayer, no babala wall that will fix your marriage. You have to tie your camel. You have to make your marriage work. If you're not happy with the state of your marriage today, look what lies within you. Look in the mirror and ask, what am I doing wrong? What am I not doing? And what should I do differently? Like I said, if we could only focus on fulfilling our obligations, wallahi, if you ask me, that is the foundation of a true relationship and a peaceful home. I was asked to talk about the evolution in marriage. And what I have done just now is fast forwarded to the state of marriages today. And it doesn't look pleasant. Some don't even relate to what I just described as to what a real relationship is meant to look like. 
and the root cause of why most marriages are on the rocks today. No, let me rewind. Let me start from the very beginning. Let me share with you what I believe will prevent problems instead of you trying to cure them, especially for those who are yet to get married. But everything I have to say also applies to those who are already married. Because if you want to fix your marriage, inshallah, this advice will help you get it right. And for those who truly, truly want to see changes and are ready to sit with their spouse and both commit, wallahi, I can promise you, inshallah, that you will see instant changes, starting with just fulfill your basic needs. But you have to be ready to make some sacrifices. You have to be ready to make some changes and commit to it, inshallah. So regardless of whether you're yet to be married, whether you've just been married, or whether you've been married for 50 years or more, the first tip I'm going to share with you is know your rights and know your obligations and make sure you fulfill them. Let that be the basic. If you're courting, talk about it because ignorance is not an excuse. It doesn't matter how many years you've been married. If you don't know your rights and obligations to your spouse, you are going to have to answer to Allah for why you didn't fulfill them. And if you're yet to be married, my advice for you is don't waste time on any bling bling wedding. Trust me. Don't go for the superficial over the substance. Later on, you're going to be looking at your wedding pictures or what you posted on Instagram and social media, and you're going to be wondering, why did I do that? Because that's not where it's all about. That's not what it's all about. And don't go into traditional and cultural norms that will make marriage difficult for your spouse. It goes against what Allah wants us to do when we get ready for marriage. Don't make life difficult. Some people make grooms to be or brides to be go through hell. Allah doesn't want that for us, but what he wants is when it comes to selecting a spouse, be very cautious, be very careful, do your homework, investigate the person you want to get married to thoroughly and talk, over talk, you can't talk enough. And don't ever ignore warning signs. If there is anything you're not comfortable with, trust me, it's Allah warning you to be careful and press your brakes. And no matter what happens, don't ever give in to pressure. Don't pressurize yourself to get married. Get married for the right reasons. And don't let people pressurize you and tell you you're getting old or all your siblings have been married. Let that never be what features because you're going to regret it. And then court the halal way. Brother Shamsuddin talked about that last week. Court the halal way. I caught it the very, very old fashioned way. And my way was when I was getting married, my, when I met, wanted to introduce my husband to be to my family, I remember my father warning me. He said, Mariam, don't allow shaitan to be the third in the room. Don't ever allow shaitan to be the third in the room. So when he came to meet my family, they made it clear that if we want to be together, we must sit in the living room. And that's how we would sit and be talking. He was on one side, I was in the opposite side. People would come and walk through us and then when I would go to his sister's house, my mother would drop me off. We sat in the living room and we caught it the halal way. Why? Because we didn't want shaitan to be the third in the room. And we wanted Allah to put his seal of approval to bless our union. People talk about dating today and they have imported this Western lingo into something that is not part of Islam. Dating is like one night stand. Dating is um, testing, tasting, touching to know how it feels. Please to God, let Allah escort you on this journey. And then if you're yet to be married, it is never too late to quit until that day of the nikah. It is never too late. Don't ever let anyone pressurize you. Oh, you're going to cause shame and disgrace to the family. It's the rest of your life. It's your happiness. You're going to be miserable. And then extremely important always start with istihara, istihara it from the very beginning. Now, since Brother Shamsuddin talked about the premarital, I'm going to stop on premarital there and continue. Do not let anyone tell you that fairy tales and love stories about marriages and they live happily ever after are in the movies and in the books. It's just that you have to create your own story. You have to both fill in the pages of the beautiful story you want to create together. You have to do it consciously. You have to do it deliberately. And most importantly, you have to do it together. 
Let me share with you what I believe is the formula for a happy home. Before I do so, Micah want to share an extremely important message with you. So I'll take a pause for a second and then I will share with you what I truly believe is the formula and what has worked for my husband and I for the past 29 years, inshallah, by September 27th. So Micah, please share your message with the audience. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, thank you very much, our guest speaker, Sister Mariam. Um, we're very happy to have everybody on board. So welcome everyone again. This is Mica Nigeria, Movement for Islamic Culture and Awareness. Um, this is the third um, program we're having in our Relationship Month. And the program which we've set aside would end next week. Um, we have a singles meetup program next week, Sunday, inshallah. There's a registration form for that. And, and the link to the registration form will be sent in the chat box. So look out for that. Then also, um, we encourage people to come and join Micah. And we encourage you to join us and also support us with your expertise and also um, with your money. Um, so if you would like to support us at Micah, um, would send, um, there's a link, you can send an email to us if you want to support us with your expertise. Maybe you have a particular skill you, you can actually use because we're all striving in the course of Allah. Or if you want to support us financially so that we can bring more programs like this um, to the Muslim audience, then the um, account number will also be placed in the chat box. And if you have any questions for us, please reach out in the chat box. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for that message. All right. Now, like I promised with you, I would be sharing with you what I believe to be a great formula for a happy home. You will most likely, once you get married, go through what is called marriage shock. That euphoric state that you had before you get married, trust me, it's not going to last forever. For me, it didn't even last two weeks. I had even asked for a divorce. Some have heard my story. The masks come off after you get married. All that sweet nothing you hear, all the best behavior. We always put our best foot forward during courtship. All that changes and you get to know your spouse's true colors. Now, hopefully, if you were very observant during the courtship, if you ask the right questions, then inshallah, if the person you got married to is sincere, then you won't be in for any big shockers or surprises. That it's so important to emphasize that you are two totally different beings. And it'll take some time for you both to adjust and synergize. For my husband and I, we fought bad fights and took so long to adjust. It took us about five to six years and studies show that it takes about five years before you finally find your groove and start to settle down into a routine where you've understood each other better you know how to fight better and so on but for some it could take longer for some it just never happens this is where you're going to need a ton of patience patience to see the results of the efforts you are both putting in and i emphasize that never forget that a true relationship is about both of you equally working on it in many homes today, you find one partner doing all the work, being more like a single parent, even when it comes to raising the children. More like, like literally, they, do, they put in all the effort. They make all the sacrifices. A successful marriage is about both partners, both parties equally committed to the success of the union, both parties equally contributing, giving and taking, both parties equally committed to the success of one another, and both parties equally committed and on the same page when it comes to nurturing a healthy family. So it's about give and take. It's about both equally putting in and both equally getting out, mutual fulfillment. Everything I am saying today applies not only to those yet to be married, but also to the newlyweds and even those who have been married for a long time who want something beautiful out of their relationship because their reality today is not that. Early on when you get married, try and set certain marriage goals for one another. Picture a vision of how you see your relationship evolving to become. 
have a big picture because that gives you a target and you're both heading in the same direction. Keep your eye on that target. That big picture is so important. And then this is important. I want to emphasize this. Identify the things that you witnessed growing up in your home as a child that you resented or you didn't like and make sure you do not replicate it in your new home. Yes, sadly, parents can get it wrong. Sadly, parents can dis create dysfunctional homes for their children. And if you are married today and you have kids, you need to ask yourself, am I replicating what I saw in my home today? Things that I detested when I was growing up. Am I replicating it with my spouse? Am I replicating with my children? And am I okay with my children replicating what they are seeing in us right now? Because you can't tell children how marriage should be. They learn based on what they see. If you think about how you're relating with your spouse, most likely you are re replicating what either your mom or your father did, how they communicated, how they expressed themselves, how they showed affection. Someone gets into a marriage. I know when I'm counseling some people and a spouse is saying, my spouse is non-expressive. Um, they just don't talk. They don't show empathy. And you ask, how was the parent? You will be able to pinpoint exactly where it came from. You cannot tell your children, you have to show them. And if you know you don't want them replicating, then you have to fix it. Why? Again, you're going to have to answer to Allah for how you modeled what an ideal family will be, how you raise them, what examples you showed them. Because as parents, our role is to pass on the baton to the next generation, just like the Prophet ﷺ passed the baton over to us. And he even said that it is his hope in his last sermon that generations after him will know the faith better than those who saw it and heard it from him directly. And that same example is in the example of how he related with his family. Our children's relationship with their spouses, with their children is actually meant to be better than ours. So are you comfortable with the way you are today with your spouse and how they will replicate it? Because your children cannot do, cannot give what they do not know, what they have never seen. Like when I described what a real marriage is meant to be, some people did not recognize that description because it sounded foreign to them. They've never seen it. So how will they go and replicate that? Our children, we always remind them that we as parents are their path to paradise, but they are also our path to hell if we don't get it right. And some parents, like I said, don't get it right. And we need to be able to admit that. We always say, oh, our paradise lies under the parents' feet. It does. But hell does too, under the children's feet, if they don't get it right. Our parents will have to answer to Allah if they raised us and we are dysfunctional. If they didn't get it right by us. The best thing you can do is pray for them. May Allah forgive them because they were as human as we are today. However, just make sure you do not pass on the wrong baton. You better make sure you get it right. Next advice I'm going to share with you is don't ever allow anyone to impose their own family traditions or culture on yours. Create your own family culture. Create your own story. Someone else will come and say, this is how we do it in our home, and that's what you sh should do. Don't make that mistake. Set boundaries. You have to protect one another from your relatives because they can destroy your marriage. My husband, Saeed, told his family when he got married to me that when that nikah was done, it was his name they called, not theirs. So that I'm not married to them. I'm married to him, and I owe them absolutely nothing. You have to have the guts to set boundaries with your families. I had to set boundaries. And today, none of our relatives from either side can ever walk into our house without making an appointment for us to come. Yes, call us on you book, but that is the right thing to do. It gives us peace of mind because nobody poke noses in our relationship. We guard it jealously and we put a fence around it. Again, if you're already married and you haven't set boundaries, you have to find a way to tactfully fix it. You may need diplomacy. Sometimes you, may to, you need to say it as it is because in-laws are destroying homes today. We have heard nightmare stories when we speak to couples when there is a crisis. 
and amongst the obligations, again, in marriage that we owe each other is to be protectors of one another, to be a shield. And again, for the women, and the first one was for the men, another obligation for women in Islam that we will have to answer to Allah for is we cannot admit into the home someone that our spouse dislikes. So if the husband protects his wife and shields her from anyone outside, whether it's relatives, friends, and so on, and the wife does not admit into the home someone that her husband dislikes right there, like I said, we've got a formula for a successful home because there is balance. Because it's about our relationship with Allah. This is Allah's injunction. It's not about our relationship with our families. It's not our culture and traditions that we're going to have to answer to Allah for. We will answer to him if we do not shield and protect our spouses. And this applies to both sides. I am sorry, I know what I'm saying may be unpleasant to many. And I may be rocking the boat, but change is not easy. But sometimes that is what it's going to take to make that change. Allah ain't going to change our condition. He's already said that. We have to take that step. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, tie your camel, then pray to Allah. If you want Allah to help you, you better first start by helping yourself. But I just feel it's important I say these things as it is. If not, why are we here? The trouble is many want things to get better, but they're not ready to do the dirty work. Like I said, there is no miracle lecture or portion that you will take that will fix your marriage. You have to take charge and you just have to do it. It is hard. It is unpleasant. It can be even painful because you may need to cut off certain ties because sometimes some of your own relations are unhealthy for you and they are better off out of your life where the prophets said it's better to be alone than to be in bad company but it's better to be in good company than to be alone and if bad company happens to be blood wallahi cut them off if they won't support you then they are not good for you if they don't wish well for you they don't wish well for your spouse if they focus more on your happiness and they're not interested in their spouse, I think about my mother-in-law and how close we are. Wallahi, I can report my husband. I did long ago, over 20 something years ago, about 26 years ago, I reported. She took sides with me. And then my mother knew that my husband and I had a quarrel once. She immediately told my husband, hold on. Five minutes later, my father was on the line and he washed me. We take sides with the opposite, and that's how it should be. You have to protect. And if your relatives are not ready to do that, then they don't mean well for you. You just have to sometimes make these very unpleasant decisions. Why? Because it's peace you want. My husband cut off ties with any friend that he felt is not in support of the happy home he wants to create. None of his friends have influence over him. And my husband made it clear. I only had one friend then and he's like, please, I don't want her. She's bad news. And I don't want her as part of our lives. And I cut off that relationship and I'm all the better for it. I describe us as antisocial, but guess what? We are with our best friends. We are with our buddies, our lover, our confidants, you know? Our mate, as Allah describes it in the Quran. So if you want change, then now is the perfect time. There's no better time than today for that change to happen. The next thing that has helped my husband and I build the relationship we have today is we started to develop a code of conduct together. And I share this in lectures a lot these days because a lot of marriages are missing this very key ingredient that is necessary certain rules that you have to promise one another that you will always observe and always fulfill. It's almost like an unwritten contract between each other, that you will always do these things. Number one for us is faith and spirituality, that Allah will feature in our relationship, in what we do, how we think, in the decisions we take. And we're gonna hold on tight to Allah's rope and he will always be our compass, our guide and our personal qibla. We do acts of spirituality together, whether it's charity, whether it's acts of service. We always talk about it and make decisions on what we're going to do together. We pray together. Even during Ramadan, my husband stays at home and leads the family in prayer. That's number one. Number two is fidelity, loyalty, and contentment. Because of how bad, how rampant, where people's conscience have died completely, and they're not afraid of the consequence of infidelity, part of our agreement is we will always be loyal and true to one another and we will be content with what we have and work on ourselves 
So don't just accept because you have an agreement, your spouse will be content, they will not cheat on you or, you know, commit zina and whatever that you can do as you please. No, we have to always be on our best behavior. We have to work on ourselves. That is so important. But that contentment, accepting that I chose to marry this person, I wasn't forced, and I'm going to work on this marriage as difficult as it may be, and no marriage is easy to build but I'm going to work on myself and inshallah, I will always find peace and contentment. I comfortably look at my husband and I say, oh my God, Allah took his time to mold his heart, to mold his soul and every inch of him just for me. And I keep saying, alhamdulillah, every day I thank Allah for this gift he has given me. Another code of conduct is mutual respect because that is the currency we interact with that no matter how angry I get, I'll never disrespect you. No matter how angry I, will get, I get, I'll never denigrate you. I will never raise my voice to you. Respect, good adab is part of being a Muslim. You can't be fighting, being disrespectful or being disrespected, being denigrated or denigrating your spouse, spouse dishonoring them and expect love and mercy to feature. Today we wonder where has the love and mercy gone? Check your your heart, check your approach. How do you talk? What is your tone? What is your body language? You cannot be unfaithful to your spouse and expect love and mercy to exist. You can't have feelings of contempt, neglect your spouse or be, feel neglected and expect peace to exist. No marriage can function normally with any of those things happening. It just simply is un-Islamic and we're going to have to answer to Allah for that. Another code of conduct is trust. We trust each other completely, that we keep no secrets. We have our devices, wallahi, not a password anywhere in this house. I have my husband's pin. I have his emails. He has my emails. We keep no secrets. I tell people, if you don't want me, my husband to know, don't tell me. No deception, no manipulation. That trust is so important that you are sincere. What you see is what you get. No game playing. Then this one is very powerful, effective communication. You must learn how to communicate with one another effectively. I took courses because I was hopeless at communicating. I couldn't talk in the right manner. I remember growing up, we are nupe, right? So my husband would say to me, Mariam, woma gaga. That's Mariam, you don't know how to talk. And I couldn't. I said whatever came to my mind when I was angry with no filter. So you must learn what is the most effective way of communicating and learn to be a good listener. We were given two ears and one mouth so that we use this one more than the other. Learn about timing. When is the best time to talk? Do you meet your spouse at the door and then boo, 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 whatever it is that's bothering you? Or maybe you have guests and then you raise something at that time with them. So what's your method? Talk about your method of communicating. Talk about everything your intimacy needs, um, your fantasies. That's the importance of effective communication. And talk about how you plan to give each other, how to resolve conflict. What's the best method? Like today, if I'm upset with my husband, I can make an appointment to fight. But like say it's something is bothering me. Whenever it's okay with you, I want to talk. And that's it. It never ever escalates to a fight. It could take him two days, three days. When he eventually sits, it doesn't happen. He just says, Mariam, come, what's bothering you? And we go from there. I used to ask him, like, why do you take so long? And he'd say, I wanted to make sure that I collect my thoughts. And no matter what you say to me, that my ego doesn't interfere when I hear something that I don't like. Another thing that really helped is feedback. Feedback, ask for feedback. You are so not perfect. So you need to know why it's about the beholder, the person on the other end. What are they seeing and what do they want to receive? The turning point after six years of horrible fights with my husband was when I asked him, what is it about me you don't like that you want me to change? What is it about me you like that you want me to improve upon? And what is it that I'm not doing you want me to start? What are your fantasies? What is it you want? What are your needs? Alhamdulillah for me, my husband reciprocated. Like I emphasize, a good marriage is about both ways. And it's not pleasant. It's not easy hearing the truth about yourself. But you have to get used to doing that. We do this regularly. About every four months, we sit down. 
Not long ago, I asked my husband a few months ago, how can I make you happier? You have to, it's about them. And alhamdulillah, if they are ready to reciprocate, then you, are, you will have a good relationship. And then do a lot of self inventory. I am very ruthless with myself. I'm very hard on myself. I beat myself up with my bad habits so badly. But I do that to keep myself on my toes so that I'm always bringing my A game when it comes to the relationship. Another code of conduct is mutual growth. Both of you need to grow and evolve in the relationship and you need to grow in the same direction. We have people who have this intellectual gap. We communicated with this lady who, oh, sorry, this gentleman who reached out, his wife moved up to having a PhD while he has a first degree. And now she talks about your kind of people. Like there's suddenly this intellectual superiority between them. You have to grow together and try and have shared interests, things in common. If you don't, I always say the risk, if you don't fulfill your spouse's needs in the home, the risk for them to find fulfillment outside begins. Then you have to learn each other's love language and basic human needs. Learn about the emotional bank account. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go on YouTube and just type love, five love languages and six basic human needs and emotional bank account. Just do that. I know there'll be a video of this recording, so due to time, I can't go through it, go into them. But when you want to deposit in your spouse's emotional bank account, make sure you're depositing in the right currency because love to you may be quite different to them. Like my husband, I can describe, he is very affectionate. He loves to hold, he loves to hug. Whenever we go out in public, if we are in the mall, my husband always holds my hands or put his arms around me. Whereas for me, my number one is actually service. Support me, support my interests, what I'm doing, have my back. And that's good enough for me. That's my number one love language. So it may be totally different. You need to know so you are depositing in the right currency. But always grow and evolve together intellectually, physically, socially, emotionally, spiritually, and in service to others. Then look good for one another and look sexy for one another. Yes, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have heard so many adeeds up to how he takes care of himself, looks good. So smell good for your spouse. Wallahi, people reach out to me and say, please talk to my spouse. They are smelling. I don't know how to tell them because I don't want to hurt their feelings. Or give talks on body odor. I lie down next to them and I want to throw up. You need to be conscious of using antiperspirants and deodorant. Perfume is not a substitute for roll-on. Some people don't get it. And I'm talking both of you. Both of you need to look good for one another. You both need to look sexy for one another. Do shakara for one another. We still flirt in this house. I'll be doing whatever my shakara, my husband will say, yeah, mm, or whatever. Even my son once noticed. I was so surprised. We're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. My husband went, combed his hair, washed his face, looked good, came into the living room. He was just wearing his t-shirt and slacks. He came into the living room and my son just looked at him and was like, Baba, ho! He's like, Mama, Mama, look at Baba. I love that. So make an effort. It's about both. And remember, you will answer to Allah about your halal relationship. So be adventurous. One of our prerequisites as Muslims who get married is to have and engage in a halal relationship with our spouse. Be adventurous in intimacy. And don't make intimacy a chore. Don't make it a routine. Boredom is a recipe for disaster when it comes to intimacy. So have fun, but it should be both of you. It's not one-sided. A lot of marriages are bankrupt of intimacy being fun and exciting. Why is it the side chick or that hot guy that should enjoy you when you have what you are going to have to answer to Allah for, for a halal relationship, do anything inside out, upside down, back to front, swing from the chandeliers, do your bedroom acrobatics, whatever pleases you, both of you. You have to make sure you take care of this department. It is so in, important, but it's about the two of you. Another code of conduct for us is that we will be each other's cheerleaders, that we will support, we will encourage, we will uplift. Let your spouse know that they matter, that they are relevant. Validate them. 
Don't let them go seeking validation outside because you didn't tell them they mean the world to you or how much they mean to you. Be very careful not saying thank you. Be very careful not showing appreciation even for the littlest things. Feed their spirit. This is one of our code of conducts. We feed each other spirits with words of encouragement, words of support, words of validation, even physical words like he does something and he just, you know, just go and give him a hug or she does something. Go give him a hug, give her a hug. Tell her you're so proud of her. Let them always look for forward to coming home to you. If you ask your spouse today, between you and Allah, do you look forward to me coming home to you? You may be in for a su surprise. We have so many more. The last I'll share with you is commitment for life. Having that mindset that I'm in this for the long haul because it helps you look at the big picture. It helps you look long term and it helps you continue to make efforts because your eyes on the target. But the fruits you start to enjoy from your little efforts, even if it is just to fulfill your obligations, wallahi is more than enough. So we have so many more of our code of conduct, but come up with your own. It doesn't matter if you've been married 30 years. If you're yet to get married, talk about it beforehand, but you have to both commit to be true to it. For us, these are our non-negotiables, our code of conduct that we both observe, observe. And we've recently added the use of phone and use of social media to our list. Why? Because we are giving the unseen more priority than the person in front of us. If I'm on the phone with my husband and someone calls me, I will never drop the phone to answer and say, sorry, someone is calling me. We're giving those who aren't in front of us more priority. We're on our devices, even with our family member lying, our spouse lying by our side, talking to strangers day and night. Don't be surprised that if you are having problems in your relationship today, one or more of these things is not in place. Then another important thing to talk about is family planning. Family planning. How many do you want to have? Those who are yet to be married and those who get married but are still newlyweds. With Allah's blessing, how many children do you want to have? When do you want to start having children? Don't ever allow anyone to pressurize you to have kids. They're not going to be there to help you raise them. And when your kids start messing around, they're going to say it's your fault. So make sure you have kids when you are ready. Nine months after the wedding, poof. We start popping these kids like rabbits. Talk about how involved will both of you be in the upbringing of your children. But I know this issue of parenting, having kids is a topic for another day because for some they think it's controversial. Some rush to have kids because they think, oh, their biological clock is ticking, they're not young, they got married old. It doesn't matter. You have kids and you're not ready or you've not finished fighting and settling into a groove. You're going to raise kids who are dysfunctional and you're going to have to answer to Allah for it. So why bring children into a world where there's no love, no communication? They didn't ask to be born. You chose to have them with Allah's blessing. But why should they not see a great model? Because they will copy what they see. And some people have this mistaken belief that the more children you have, it'll solve your problem. Well, lie, it makes things worse. If you've not gotten your act together, children are going to mess up your relationship. My biggest fear is that we're going to have to answer to Allah. Our children are going to report us to Allah and say, my mother married a terrible father. And that's why I ended up being the way I am. My husband and I waited six years. And before we got married, this was something Saeed raised and discussed with me. That he still has some skeletons, or should I say demons in his, that he wants to deal with. Some baggage of things that he experienced growing up. And he's not ready to be a father. And I was 18 when I got married. And he's like, you sure ain't ready to get your mother because I was a hot-headed, rebellious teenager. But he mentioned how he's going to be a hands-on father, how he's going to be a deliberate father. And he was. He changed diapers. He took them away from me when he knew I needed to sleep. This was the agreement. Today, our children are all in university. But wallahi, we spend hours talking to them on the phone. And we let them loose to the world because we planted the seeds we, we can we were conscious, we were there, we were deliberate. And they are close to their dad. A lot of fathers don't know their children today. 
But like I said, the issue to do with parenting is a discussion for another day. In conclusion, just remember, no matter how many years you've been married, people change, people grow, they evolve, and their needs change. So don't ever allow your relationship to be stagnant. And always, always ask for feedback. It is so important so that you know what their new needs are. And like I said, mine is an inventory every four months or so where I want to know what am I doing wrong? How can I make you happier? What else would you like me to do? And then introspect, look at yourself ruthlessly, look at your bad habits, remove the weeds in this beautiful garden that you are nurturing, adding sunlight and nutrients to. And then seek to understand because of this evolution we all go through, seek to understand and accommodate one another as long as those changes are healthy for both of you. But no matter what happens between you and your spouse, never lose sight of their endearing qualities, what you fell in love with. If that person you fell in love with has changed or is no longer there, find them and bring them back. They didn't disappear by accident. You chase them away. And the reality is, whatever the state of your marriage may be today, if it is great, always ask, how did I contribute to making it great? If you did, always ask, if your marriage is good, how did it happen that way? Why? Because these things don't happen by accident. And if it is not good, ask not, what did they do wrong that it became not good? Ask what did you do or what didn't you do to make it what it is today? The big question is, are you ready to open a new chapter? Are you ready to sit with your spouse and talk? Are you ready to ask for feedback and put your ego aside? Even the Prophet ﷺ consulted his spouses and he also asked for feedback. So be conscious in your marriage, be deliberate in your marriage, be present in your marriage. Marriages don't run on autopilot. Marriages don't run by luck or by accident. It takes conscious, deliberate efforts. Now, having said that, sometimes in spite of all your good efforts, you have done everything in your power to make things work. Unfortunately, your spouse does not reciprocate. What I said earlier about what the Prophet ﷺ said, that sometimes it's better to be alone than to be in bad company. And sometimes if you're being depreciated, if you find you're depleting in value, you're being broken, you're not gaining, you're not growing, you're not evolving upwards, you're going down, you're going backwards, you're a shell of who you are, you're losing your identity, then sometimes divorce does need to happen. As unpleasant as it may be, as much as Allah dislikes it, it is permissible because Allah isn't impressed by your suffering in marriage. That is not the jihad. The jihad is your patience and perseverance to see the results of both your efforts. But if divorce does occur and you happen to have children, remember something, you are parents for life. Don't ever talk bad about the mother or the father of your children. Don't ever draw your children into the battlefield. Wallahi, they are going to resent you later on. And you could raise dysfunctional children by doing so. But never consider divorce until you have exhausted all options. But that description of marriage that I gave you at the beginning of two partners, Wallahi, there reaches a stage where you almost think your hearts are beating simultaneously. I am living proof that beautiful relationships do exist today in spite of all the bleak stories we've heard and sadly some that we have seen ourselves but have hopes have big dreams for your marriage make sure you marry the right spouse if you're not yet married that shares your vision shares your value shares your goals for what a true relationship will be and if your marriage has reached rock bottom and what you believe you have now is ashes, don't give up on your spouse. Don't give up on your marriage. They may have gone into hiding because of the circumstances or the toxicity of the relationship. But if your spouse is worth fighting for, I ask you for the sake of Allah, work on yourself. Sit down and talk. And inshallah, Allah will fill in the blanks. He has promised us that we need to make that effort and pray hard. Pray, make dua upon dua fast. Because once you put in the effort and you do those things, I promise you Allah will never leave you in despair. 
May he put his blessing in your union. May he put lights in your heart. May he grant you the ability to see your faults and your flaws. And may he grant you the ability to work ruthlessly, to break any habits that are destroying you and destroying your relationship. And may he bless you all in the best manner. For those who are yet to get married, may Allah grant you that companion that he has created just for you. And may you be that partner for your spouse. To Micah, Jazakumullah Khairan once again for organizing this event. May Allah bless you all. May all you do serve as a witness for you in the life to come, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, dear sister Miriam Nemu. Um, we had a wonderful time listening to you. Um, the lecture was very inspiring, and thank you for sharing all the tips, all the code, um, code of conduct which worked for you. And we pray that inshallah we'll have more happy, we'll have happier Muslim homes. I mean. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, so now we're going to take questions. Um, we're going to the question and answer session, and we'll be taking questions from our participants. So already I have some questions here. Yeah, if you have questions, you can drop your questions in the chat box. I will read them while our speaker um, answers the question. Um, as much as possible, we want people to be brief in their questions. Let your questions be clear. Um, all questions will be taken through the chat box. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so the first question, which I am going to be reading out here, I have a question. Um, okay, so the first question is, kindly elaborate more on submissiveness in a premarital relationship. Um, so a sister asks that you should explain, um, elaborate more on submissiveness in premarital relationship. Um, that's the first question. Can I answer um, that first? <laughs> Let me take okay, one yes, at a time, please. please. Okay. Um, if you're courting someone, you don't owe them anything. If you're not engaged to be married, it's not legalized in the eyes of Allah, um, and you're not engaged, then um, definitely you don't owe them anything. During courtship, it's that period of getting to know one another. And if your spouse-to-be is trying to make you submit to them, um, obedience to your husband, if you are female, um, is one of the prerequisites in Islam and one of the obligations we as wives owe our husband. But that does not mean to be enslaved. That does not mean that they are meant to lord over us. Now, let me explain, because I use my husband as an example. I see my husband as the boss of this family. Why? Because Allah, Allah says so, that he is the boss. Now, any boss, any leader should be one that you look up to, that you respect, that you believe their vision, their goal, where they want to go to is where you want to go to. And as a follower, I'm ready to follow you if you're going to lead me in the right direction. So I will always honor you. I will always honor my husband because he has fulfilled his promises. And I love where he's heading. I love his focus on spirituality. I love first in everything we do. He encourages me to join him when he fasts and all those things. So, and the way he thinks, um, his maturity, his dignity, his honesty, his everything. So for me, I'm ready to follow his instructions. He says, Mariam, I want you to do this. I will submit, I will do. I will follow you as a leader because I trust you. However, if submission means oppression, even like I said, oppression is worse than slaughter in Islam. So let people not change the meaning of what Allah prescribed marriage to be and what a spouse is meant to be. Because if he says we have created for you mates, who is your classmate? I mean, superiority in the eyes of Allah is not based on gender. It's based on taqwa. It's based on consciousness of him. So if he says it's not a man or a woman that's better than any other, then let nobody lord over someone else because even for Allah, we are all the same. But as a spouse, yes, the man is the head of the household. But I always emphasize the men... The man needs to make sure he's heading in the right direction. You earn respect. You don't just get it automatically. These are just rules. Don't just say, okay, because it's an obligation, you are cheating on me and then I should respect you. 
because that's an obligation I owe you. It doesn't work. I'm human and I have feelings. And like I said, the heart has been created in a way that it loves those who, who show kindness towards me. If you don't show me kindness, you don't show me respect, you don't honor me. You want me to do it automatically. That is not a happy home. And if Allah talks that he has put love and mercy in our hearts and we are supposed to dwell in tranquility, you can't have a tranquil home if you're not treating your spouse well if you're disrespecting them. So for me, if it's premarital, just make sure you both truly understand the meaning of that. So you don't go in with this mistaken belief that they are your Lord and you submit to them. It has to be both ways. That's my opinion. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, another question that we have here is, um, what are the rights of a married woman in Islam? And also, what are the rights of the man as well? Mm. So what okay. are the rights of a man and a woman in marriage? What are the rights of a man and what are the rights of the woman? Okay, um, let me start. The rights of a husband. The first is, um, sorry, the responsibilities of a husband is to pay the dowry, the mahir, during the nikah. However, it's not meant to be a large sum that gives him, that's why I say don't go and put things that make it a burden because in these, this day and age, um, you find people who are demanding ridiculous amounts of money. That is the one that even Allah prescribes for us that we should be easy on, it, on them. Don't make it difficult. Don't make it a burden. In fact, when my dad married my mom, he borrowed his dowry, the dowry from her to do the nikah. He didn't have any money whatsoever. So the first is the dowry. The second is an allowance. Your spouse, if it's the man or you are the woman asking, you are entitled to an allowance. My husband and I have an agreement and every quarter he gives me a lump, a lump sum of money. And that is your money. It's nobody's money. It's not for the household chores. It's not for food. It's not for toilet paper. It's yours to do as you please with it. So an allowance. Then a comfort double accommodation. You're not meant to be taken into a dump. You're not meant to be taken and asked to just stay with in-laws. No. Accommodation where you will be comfortable, you will feel safe. Then to treat his wife fairly. To treat his wife fairly or wives fairly, equally. And then a husband owes a responsibility is to be a protector or a shield to her, like a garment. And then love kindness and respect like i mentioned earlier then the rights of the husband you the woman you owe him this obedience and to serve him not slave and i've explained that but you owe him to be obedient to him and then a halal relationship with his wife he is entitled to a halal relationship with you and then you do not have any right to admit into the home anyone he doesn't like and you are meant to take his permission before you go out of the house. These are rights of the husband. And then your husband has a right to your love, you being kind to him, and you showing respect to him. And then for the responsibilities of the wife, what she owes her husband, number one is obedience. So we've talked about that. Number two is a halal relationship with her husband, that she gives him that. And then not admitting anyone into the home that he dislikes, and then asking for her husband's permission before going out and serving her husband, the same as the other one that I've explained. And then a right of a wife, what the wife has every right to is your, you have the right to that dowry and it's yours. You have the right to an allowance. You have a right to a comfortable accommodation. You have the right to be loved by your husband, to receive kindness, to receive respect. And this last one is very interesting, acquiring knowledge. You have the right to acquire knowledge in the relationship. You have the right to acquire knowledge, to increase in knowledge. And that is part of your right and one of the obligations your husband owes you. So that's it. Those are the written obligations of spouses in marriage. All right. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, another question here is, what is the best advice for a young Muslim who intended to marry a Muslim for love and for the sake of Allah and later turned down by the Muslim who toyed with his undiluted emotions? So this person is asking that, uh, what's the best advice for a young Muslim who intended to marry a Muslim but was turned down? Um, what is not meant for you 
won't come your way. And don't despair. If she turns you down, just know that there is someone out there that Allah has created for you. Continue to search, continue to pray, continue to fast, continue to ask Allah to grant you that companion and show you where to find them. Um, these days, there are so many different methods of finding a spouse. The more conventional one is through word of mouth um, or through families arranging. Um, but you also have the unconventional that's actually taking, picking up speed today, which is through um, matrimonial halal uh, matchmaking sites. So it's some, you know, try different methods. I have a friend who found their um, spouse to be, and they're almost getting ready to get married on that site. I spoke to someone two days ago who actually has been married five years and they found a spouse through that means. But sometimes you could go to events. I'm sure when Micah organize events, they may have matchmaking services. NASFAT may have an other organizations you may belong to. Um, so yeah, you know, just know that maybe Allah was protecting you from something and say Alhamdulillah and continue to pray. All right. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, just to chip in, we have a program that is coming up next week, inshallah, next week, Sunday. And this program is a singles meetup program. It's an opportunity for um, eligible singles to meet people who are ready to commit into a serious relationship. And so um, please check the chat box for the registration link if you're interested. Um, okay, so another question that I have here is, how do you reach an equilibrium between your family and the spouse? So this person is asking about how you manage your own family and also your spouse, their relationship. Yeah. Okay. Your number one obligation, um, you know, is to this person that you married. I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman asking. If it's a man asking, you went and took someone's daughter out of her home and brought her into your home. So you owe her which is why I talked about protecting your spouse from your relations because they are destroying marriages today. However, that balance, I think like my husband did for me, I know the relationship he has with my family and the relationship I have with his family, Alhamdulillah has worked well for us. From the beginning, he made sure he set boundaries that this is my wife and I don't want anybody poke nosing in our affairs. So let me draw the line and make that clear. However, we still go together to visit his mom. His father, may Allah, Allah Yerhamu, is of late. Um, and he was extremely close to my mom. They, they were such close buddies. My mom would confide in him and ask him, seek his advice and consult him on issues that she would never ask my brother and I because she said we're too emotionally attached to her that we mean give biased advice. So, and the same with my dad, he's very, very close. In fact, even today I get jealous. We go to visit my dad and he's really, really, he's in his nineties and he sees me all the time. But when my husband enters the room, his face literally lights up. And I love that in spite of his memory going, he still has this fondness, a relationship with my husband and my husband just sits by his bedside and they just gist and so on. So I think it's about the word is the balance. Equilibrium is it actually. Um, with everything in life, there needs to be balance. Don't go and give this one so much that you don't give this other side um, sufficient, but you have to prioritize who comes first. Um, and then you go, like my children, if you ask them now, who comes first in our lives? That's my husband and I, they would say it's Allah first. Who comes second? It is me, myself and I, because if I'm in order, I can get the world in order. If I am in order, I can give them the best of me. Then who comes third? They will say, if it's me, they will say, it's my husband. And if it's their dad, they will say, it's mama. And then who comes fourth? It's them. So we make sure they know they, this is our top four. Then we have love to give everybody else afterwards in whatever order, of course, our parents. And then I talked about parents. Sometimes your parents are not correct. And this is a reality we just have to start talking about. Sometimes our parents mess us up. And sometimes our parents deserve dua, but like I know an example my husband was sharing with me where you have a mother who goes and sees Babalawo and these malams and so on, and she asks you for your vehicle to go there and you're like, no way am I giving you my car to go. Enter public transport, ride kekena pepper, whatever you want. I'm not gonna be a party to this. There are times where you have to put your foot down and not oblige them. When you have mothers-in-law, 
interfering in your relationship, uh, oppressing your spouse, you need to put your foot down and put an end to it. So there are boundaries. I mean, in any relationship, you have to set boundaries to make sure people do the right thing. As long as you do the right thing, you show respect, you respect what I have, what I'm building. If you don't and you're interfering, then you don't mean well for me and my family. You've already lived your life. You may have messed up yours, but please don't mess up mine. So that issue of relatives and equilibrium and balancing, let everything use common sense. It's as simple as that. Allah is not going to be impressed by you just submitting and doing as they please if they are crossing the lines even in the eyes of Allah. You have to speak up. Like my husband, I heard him give well, a gentleman advice who was having issues with his mother. He's like, you have to talk to her because Allah will ask you how you saw your mother going astray and what did you do about it? And what didn't you do to allow her to continue? So for me, I just really believe in this straight talk now about parents. I love my parents to death. Wallahi, my parents did an amazing job raising my brother and I, and we saw a beautiful relationship that we are emulating. But where they go wrong, where they make mistakes, I say. Like me, I say my parents made a mistake. They didn't tell me you fight in marriage because I never grew up seeing fights. So today I say, yes, that was a big problem. For six years we fought. And I went in with this delusion that you don't fight in marriage. Two weeks into the marriage, I wanted a divorce. Why? Because I didn't know couples fight. I didn't. So that's the reality. I mean, we really have to just say it as it is. All right. Thank you very much Ma, um, for telling us about the priorities and also um, for telling us about setting boundaries. Um, so we have another question here. Someone is asking, can you suggest books or um, links for positive parenting? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I can. What I could do is though, because I need to quickly find it. I've got it in some of my notes um, because I've I've just created a premarital online course, which is about to be launched in the next month or so. And in there, I talk about parenting and there are books and readings for premarital and for parenting, hopefully, so you get it right before you go into marriage. Um, so I'll have to go there and look for the books and then maybe I will post it to you. You will know how to share it with them since you have a mailing list. All right, that works. Um, Could so I just say something? There is a book. It's not a Muslim book, but Wallahi, I, for me, I know that book um, contributed a lot to how I'm living my life today. Um, and it's not a religious book. I want to emphasize this, but it's Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families by Stephen Covey, because he gives the most amazing advice. And you can find the book online, even free. Of, the book is free on, in eBooks. Um, if you have any eBook links, um, that you, or apps that you can download, or you go on YouTube, just type Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. A gazillion people have broken that book down. I know that book changed the way I discipline the children, um, because my husband and I are firm on discipline. We don't tolerate nonsense, um, but we love also, so it's, we try to balance it. But I would say that for me was a huge turning point in the approach I took and about understanding the diversity in our kids and how different they are. So for me, that's one of the first books that comes to mind. But there are others, inshallah, that I will share with you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have other questions in the chat box, which I'm trying to read now. Um, so somebody is asking here. Sorry. I'm so he's saying that, um, how do you convince your parents to to you getting married. Let's say you have someone serious and, or, and also ready to get married, but they keep insisting that you need more money for a big wedding. But all you want is a small halal wedding, a, a small halal wedding. Can we go ahead and get married without their blessings? So someone is asking that question. May Allah bless you for having um, you know, that intention because really this is so rare today when you see these ridiculous videos and pictures on social media of what weddings look like today um yeah it's such a tough one and just to answer your question yeah if you you can go to a sharia court and ask uh, 
um, the judge will actually end up being your wali and will conduct the nikah for you. Um, it is an emotional roller coaster. It's not easy. Um, and I know a couple of people that have actually done it where they didn't get their parents' support and they went ahead and did the nikah. Um, and why? In their case, the parents didn't support was more based on tribe, not because of religion or um, some alarm bells that went off in their minds. But I would say definitely there are options, but you should have exhausted all options because many times the family turns their backs. It causes a lot of um, turmoil in the home. But, you know, do your homework. Make sure, first of all, this person is worth the fight, you know, that they are the right person. Do your istihara, open istihara, um, pray fast, um, do sadaqah over the issue, ask others to help you do istihara over the matter so that you make sure this is the right person. And then you may need to speak to some respected members of the community or respected family members, maybe uncles or aunts, to help speak to them and see if they can convince them um, that you do not want a bling bling wedding. Um, you want to keep it simple. I know my boys said, um, you know, they just want to have a wedding by a stream where there's a willow tree and we just put, um, throw tablecloths on the floor and we just sit and have a picnic. <laughs> Call the imam, let him do the nikah and everybody go. We just wear, you know, shirts and jeans and so it's just so sweet I love that and hey I love that and I'm ready to do it and I'm not joking but um, that's yeah from a religious point of view you do have those options you can go to a Sharia court um, but may Allah make it easy it's not pleasant it's emotionally draining and may he guide you through this process inshallah I mean um, thank you very much we have another question here which is how can one work on having inner peace and contentment? Ah, well, <laughs> that's another topic in itself. Inner peace. Inner peace and contentment in a relationship or between you and Allah, you and yourself. There are so many tentacles to this. Um, the first for me, I would say, is Allah first. If you um, trust Allah to be your guide uh, and you follow his injunctions, I'm not a religious fanatic, so please don't get me wrong. Um, people still today tell me I'm not Muslim enough and um, I'm not hijabed enough, that my dressing is haram, my lipstick is haram. I used to sell them, show me where in the Quran it says lipstick is haram. But with regard to my relationship with my Lord, what I love is I've got the Quran that he has, that is his word. And I know it is him speaking to me live and direct, not through a middleman or a middleman's interpretation of the faith. And everything in there I am okay with. What I don't understand, I find those who are more knowledgeable than I am and I ask them to clarify and explain. However, I love the connection. Once upon a time, I wasn't praying. For like five years, I wasn't praying. I felt Allah didn't know I even existed. And, um, you know, it took me, it's a journey. I'm still on the journey to discovering Islam. And each day I open a new page and I love the beauty of what I see and the simplicity and the mercy and Rahmah um, of Allah. So for me, I just find that, you know, as he said, if you are conscious of him, he will provide for you from sources you never expected. And being conscious of Allah is allowing him to be your compass and your guide. What I say, what I mean by that is in your thoughts, because it, everything starts with the thoughts, with the mind. What do you think of? And then what do you turn into action? What do you manifest into a reality? So the thoughts, the intentions, and the actions all go together. And as long as you always ask, will Allah be pleased with me if I do this? It gives me peace of mind because he doesn't want me to gossip. So I don't gossip. He doesn't want me to cheat, to lie, to steal, um, to fornicate. And if I just follow those rules, well, it gives me peace of mind. And then the other obligations. For me, half of my faith is to make sure I am the best wife I possibly can be for my husband and the best mother for my children and the best daughter and the best employee or employer. And all those things are connected to my faith. So when I say Islam, we've all heard Islam is a way of life and it's sounds so cliche, but it's like, it's all encompassing. It's everything in the way I dress. I'm conscious of my Islam. Will Allah be pleased with me? In my utterances, am I pleased? Is Allah going to be pleased with me? Am I conscious that I am a representative? I am an ambassador of Allah on this earth. And that, you know, he says he has made me his Khalifa, um, his representative. And how do I represent Allah well? How do ambassadors represent their country? well. I mean, you got to be on your best behavior, especially if you're representing your creator. 
and in what way, in my thoughts, in my utterances, in my deeds, if I connect all those things, it just is so simple. And I know as a human, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to mess up. But Allah is Gafur Rahim. He is so forgiving. And every time I go astray, if my, sin, if my intention is sincere, my repentance is sincere, he has promised he will forgive me. And that he will always be close to me and the trials I go through, the burdens on my shoulder, whether it's people who are going through divorce or they've lost a loved one or they're going through depression or their child is crippled um, or disabled. Let me use that word. Um, you know, whatever trial and heaviness you feel in your heart, maybe from betrayal or whatever, you know, your trial may be your family members, your parents, it could be your children. And you know that these trials are a test of your faith and each time connected. What does Allah want me to do in this situation? How did the Prophet وسلم, and other prophets before him handle such a situation? And what is, what is my A-game that I can bring to this circumstance I'm in so that I pass Allah's test? I mean, those are all thoughts that have to go through your mind that will allow you just give you peace of mind. So if you want peace and contentment and happiness, then do what you're supposed to do and always be conscious of him. Let him be running in your background, you know, am I doing the right thing? Don't be hard on yourself. Don't be extre an extremist. Don't be a fanatic. Be kind to people. Be considerate, but be kind to yourself. Love yourself. You really have to do that. If you don't love yourself, what are you going to offer the world? You can't give the best of you. And Allah doesn't make mistakes. Whatever you are, whatever your circumstances, whether economic background, the family you were born with, into it's not an accident your education all these things happen as a trial so how do you make sure you use them i didn't get a degree but i feel i'm doing living my best life today and using what i have learned and my hunger and desire to learn and grow and most importantly contribute to live a peaceful life and fulfilling life and i don't tell anybody anything i try not to i'm not it's not easy not to look for trouble but i try my best not to look for people's trouble but for me it's like don't hold people like they say in mind you sleep well at night for me that's what gives me peace of mind that i am giving the best i have to offer because allah didn't give it to me to keep to myself it is to achieve my greatest calling even if first i have to be complete and that's what I try to do, continue to build myself, evolve, make myself an asset so that I can give the very best I have to offer. So I think that's it, if you ask me. All right. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, we are actually wrapping up now. Um, before we do so, we'll take a few more questions and wrap up. Um, so I have one question here that says, what's your take on long courtship? Mm -hmm. So somebody is asking, what's your take on long courtship? Um, so let me add one more question. Mm -hmm. um, the other question is, what can you say about a spouse who feels you are too religious? Okay, let me take the first one. Um, what, what's my take on long courtship? Well, there's nobody that can tell you how long you should court, but I'm not one in favor of anything under even six months, if you ask me, because it's easy to be on your best behavior for that period of time. And sometimes even in five years of courtship, you may not know their true colors. If we're going to be honest, if somebody is determined to deceive you, they will. However, I feel it gives you enough time to do your investigation and to learn about their background, to ask about their family. Um, there's a lady who, um, she's Nigerian, she lives in the United States and has three children and her husband had just visited her and left then lockdown began and the husband reached out to us and said, you know, he, he was having issues and so on. Um, his wife suddenly said she wanted a divorce and it just sounded so sad and so pathetic. Like, you know, please can we reach out to her and like, please don't do this. So when we did, by the time we started asking questions, we discovered that she didn't know he had been married. Uh, sorry, his father had been married to about 12 different women. Um, before, you know, like he grew up in a single, with a single mom and never really witnessed a happy home um, because amongst the things she complained about is he had no expression, he had no emotion, he didn't, um, he was very selfish, he, he didn't care about her feelings, um, you know, and every expression of love she tried to give him, he didn't reciprocate. So 
you know, by the time you find out like, okay, he doesn't, didn't have the right model. Not that if you didn't have the right model, you can't fix it. First, you have to identify you didn't have the right model, then do your homework to learn. So don't get me wrong. Um, and there are some people who have identified what I grew up with is so bad. I want to make sure I don't do it. So I'm going to make sure I fix myself and that I don't have any excess baggage that I carry on into the relationship. But the issue to do with, you know, this length of courtship is for you to know more about them, to ask the right question, observe them in different settings. Not only how do they relate with you, but how do they relate, to, relate with others? Um, because it's a reflection of what's to come. If they're relating in a very terrible way with someone, well, they're bit on their best behavior with you. That's why you've not seen that side. But when marriage comes, um, and the masks come off, you will be on the, you'll be the brunt of that um, and then the receiving end of that. So I think um, definitely until you feel right. That's why Istihara is so important as a guide for you and uh, make sure you don't, like I said before, ignore warning signs. Don't think, oh, I will fix them. Um, things like that never work out. Uh, just make sure it's when you have complete peace in your heart that all the questions, all the concerns you have, have been addressed properly to the best of your ability. Don't be so eager to rush into marriage that's meant to be for the rest of your life. That is so important. That's why even uh, in Islam, we are asked to be cautious when it comes to spouse selection. Pull your brakes. Make sure you get married for the right reasons. And um, one of the right reasons is like, if you say it's beauty, my dad told me, if you think, he told my husband and I before, just before we got married, that if you think you are attractive, you're beautiful, it'll fade, you know? And so that is such, and if you're attracted to something beautiful and bling bling, it will fade. So make sure you're getting married for the right reasons. Don't get married due to pressure. Don't get married um, due to wealth. Don't get married um, because people or you tell yourself that your biological clock is ticking, blah, blah, blah. Get married because you feel you are right, because you've got to be in order. In fact, if I'm to answer that question, let me rewind. I would say get married when you know what you want. You are self-aware. You have a lot of EQ, emotional intelligence and social intelligence, because these are all things that you need within. You need to know what you want. You have to have a vision for your life. You have to start living. Don't wait till you get married to start living your life. Be on the path and then the person who is good for you will hop in and you both find your level. Um, so move in the right company if you want to attract the right kind of spouse and you be the right person. Because I always say Mr. Right or Miss Right is looking for Miss Right and Mr. Right. So don't, not Miss Wrong, not Mr. Wrong. So make sure you are in the right company and the right people. I hope that answers the question. So take your time. But to me, honestly, I think six months is even too short. I know some get married in a much shorter period of time and may Allah put their, his blessings in their union and some marriages like that do work out. But I just know based on the counseling we do, the kind of things that do come up later on. Sorry, the second question was? Um, the second question is, um... What do you say about a spouse who feels you are too religious? Mm. Um, as long as you are not a fanatic, as long as you are not extreme, um, and you are observing your ibadah between you and Allah, and you're comfortable with where you are, continue. I mean, your spouse shouldn't tell you to take off if you're a woman, your hijab, or for you to say, stop praying. I mean, right there, there's a serious problem. Anything that goes against what Allah wants, your faith, then there's a problem. You need to stand up and seek intervention. Talk and talk and over talk. I mean, sometimes that's why I'll say, you lakum dinukum waliya din. I know it doesn't apply, but sometimes it's like, okay, you do your own the way you're comfortable with and leave me to do my own the way I'm comfortable with. But the problem is that with that is when you start to have children. Because if you're not careful, they will follow the other. And if you, that's why that premarital and being on the same page with your vision for your marriage is so critical because you're going to have kids and their mother or father is not a bad person. She, you are married to them. So if they choose to follow the other person's way, how do you reconcile that? Because you can't force. Sit and talk and say, this is what it does for me. This is the kind of peace I have. This is how comfortable I am and what I want to do. And I ask you to please support me on this. I'm not asking you to join me if you're not comfortable. 
but I'm asking you to please understand and respect what I want, what gives me true happiness. I mean, that's what I think. I saw some questions like, what are my social media handles? Well, um, Instagram, it's Mariam Lemu official. And then YouTube, it's Mariam Lemu. Because somebody also asked the question, um, how do I get to know more about the code of conduct? And I've got the videos on that where I go into more detail of it. So um, that one is on YouTube and on Facebook, both just under Mariam Lemu. But Instagram is Mariam Lemu official. So yeah, let me make it easy. Thank you.